right, a big welcome to all you accursed out there. It's time for Curse of Politics. Here with me, as they always are, and never not ready to put the cuss in disgust, are Jenny, I'll take no shit from you, Burn and Scott, but I've got so much shit to give, Reed. <laughs> and today, it's going to be exactly what you think it's going to be. The Night of the oh, Long no. Knives for Aaron O'Toole. And the trucker convoy descending on Ottawa. You thought you'd rather heard it all, but no. We have our own perspectives on this, and we'll incorporate our cursed clipping of the week, and then to close the show, as we always do, we'll get to our hey yous. Jenny, Scott, mercy sakes alive, good buddies. We've got ourselves a jam-packed show today. <laughs> and 11 long-haired friends of Jesus in a chartreuse <laughs> microbus. <laughs> <laughs> I like me a little C.W. McCall. I really like All right, so just much. to start off with, I have to say this to you both. Yeah. I want you to want me. Okay. February 1st, 1979, the release of Live at Budokan by Cheap Trick. I was wondering why the Cheap One of my favorite Trick albums company. of all time, one of the great live albums of all time, one of those circumstances where a band hits a level live that they were never able to hit in the studio. It's a little gem. Cheap trick, live at Budokan. Bun E. Carlos. Happy anniversary. A drummer with style. <laughs> Happy anniversary. And on the drums, Mr. Bun E. Carlos. All right. How are you this week? Anything going on? Nah, nothing. A slow week, isn't it? <laughs> As my grandma would say, Grandma Kerr would say, I'm all wound up like a whipper whale's ass. <laughs> Jenny, I don't understand. You look so put together. I think if I was in your circumstance, there'd be like a pizza box in the background and beers and coffee spread all over the place. Well, why? I'm in I'm in Florida. I'm, I've, I've got a I've got a busy day uh, with uh, with work when we're done this call. Pins right. and string on the wall and uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> sort of really <laughs> rough sketches of Aaron O'Toole falling from water towers, all kinds of stuff. Oh, fuck. All right. So listen, until last night, I thought that this pod was going to be almost entirely about the demonstration and the convoy in Ottawa. But uh, I think we're going to have to squeeze in this uh, development in the conservative uh, leadership race. Um, but let's start with the demonstration in Ottawa. Let's start there. I'll give you my take. There may have been some good people wanting to make a point about vaccine mandates in that demonstration. But there are lots of people there for whom vaccine mandates were an excuse to make much uglier points. And I don't have a lot of sympathy for allegedly good people who can tolerate demonstrating next to a Nazi. Uh, I would think a person would see a swastika and say, wow, I really need to drop my protest against vaccine mandates for a second and take on this Nazi. Not to mention that the official purpose of the demonstration, the convoy, was to overthrow the government, which in and of itself is not kosher. Having said that, I don't intend to both sides this, but I will say that the intransigent smugness with which the government responds doesn't sit well with me either. The Liberals don't need to truck or trade with those protesters, but they should be reflecting on why they are at or below 30% in the polls, and whether they're in any way responsible for how the back row is reacting to them. So after a few days of thinking about it, that's what I think. What about you guys? Yeah, the, I, I, listen, David, I, I actually, what I would turn around, though, is I think the vast majority of people there were actually peaceful and were there uh, to, prote to protest uh, different parts of uh, either vaccine mandates. Some of them might have been anti-vaxxers. I think you had people that were generally just sick of COVID and sick of lockdowns and 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 what have you. And I know that's provincial, but I think it, this was lumped in. It's, 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 as I said last week, even, I think the untold story is the number of, uh, uh, the number of people uh, along the route, the thousands and thousands along the route that didn't go to the protest, uh, but were getting together to show support. And that, and, and uh, th those were people like, I, I, I said it on TV this weekend. Those are people that you don't see on Twitter, the microcosm of Twitter that is just filled with hate and even more so this weekend on a whole host of uh, levels. There, there are the, the, the people on Facebook, my high school friends whose, you know, kids are depressed and who's they're sick of their kids wearing masks and they're on the verge of losing their business. Um, uh, and those are, those I think are the untold people. And to your point in terms of uh, the liberal reaction, um, 
uh, the liberal reaction to, uh, uh, to, to the protest yesterday. Uh, it was actually shocking just the level of vitriol uh, coming from uh, and self-righteousness coming from, uh, uh, fr- fr- from not seeing any points, uh, secondary points of view, obviously using this to score political points, uh, coming from a guy who, and, and, and using the most inflammatory language, like we can go back and forth in terms of, it, it is 100% unacceptable uh, for anyone to fly a Nazi flag ever, anywhere, for any reason. Um, uh, but but where is the outrage on a almost weekly basis where there's protests outside of City Hall uh, where it's, you know, death to Israel and swastikas flying? You, know, you don't see liberal politicians out there with the exact same vitriol. There was there was the same messaging Saturday in the streets, uh, in the streets of uh, in the streets of Toronto happening at the exact same time. And, and we heard uh, nothing about it. So I think that and, and in terms of marching, you you say you're the company you keep, uh, David, you're you're you guys, Denny Coderre, he marched in a parade beside people people that were wa- waving the Hezbollah flag, which is, it's, it's a pretty noticeable flag. It's a terrorist organization. It's the hand holding up a Kalashnikov uh, rifle. And so I think that, um, I think that there's a lot of smugness for liberals right now. Um, and they're trying to focus on a few issues without actually seeing what is transpiring across the country in terms of where the mood people are, are currently at politically, especially regarding uh, COVID and, and lockdowns and policies around COVID. Well, to be honest, I thought about setting aside this ongoing story I've been telling about 5G Spectrum, but then I decided, no, I'm not going to do that because I might never come back to it. It would just sit there, unfinished, unfulfilled. And that, Hurley Burleyates, is precisely the point of this next part of the story from our presenting sponsor, TELUS, about the best way to get high-speed 5G wireless connectivity right across our entire country, not just the big cities, but all rural, remote, and indigenous communities. This is Chapter 3, A Tale of Two Policies, or Why Set-Asides Must Be Set-Aside. We've been talking about how the feds are holding public consultations on the best way to auction a new, critical, mid-band of 5G spectrum, which can carry reams of data over super-long distances and will make connectivity so much faster. And last week, I told you how 100 megahertz channels is the international standard for delivering the maximum benefits of 5G to customers. With a 100 megahertz caps policy in place, four different carriers like TELUS will have enough of that spectrum to launch their 5G networks equally in every market, which means they'll have to compete aggressively to provide the best service to their customers. Contrast that with set-asides the other policy under consideration. Set-asides reserve a portion of spectrum, subsidized greatly, for regional carriers with healthy balance sheets who have not deployed the spectrum in rural areas where connectivity is needed. This isn't folly, it's fact. Historically, these regional carriers have deployed less than 20% of the rural spectrum they hold from previous auctions. Instead, they just sit on it, or they sit on it and wait until later when they try to sell it at a huge profit, which is known as spectrum speculation. Meanwhile, Canadians in those markets suffer. Hurley Burleyites, it's the prime reason so many of our rural, remote, and Indigenous communities don't have adequate high-speed connectivity right now. So the way this new auction is conducted is critical to providing 5G access to every single Canadian household. And the best part is... You can have your say in the process by going to telus.com slash get 5G right. The story continues next week. Uh, well, I come from a very different place on this, and I'm not particularly um, I'm not particularly balanced in my perspective. Um, you know, I, I don't think that the frustration that large swaths of the population feel because we're still stuck in this thing um, is justifying, uh, or, um, or, or explainative of what we saw. I don't think that the people that showed up and that were, you know, pissing on the war memorials and flying Nazi flags, I don't think they're representative of the frustration that people feel about being, uh, being forced to slog through more of the pandemic. I don't, I don't think that's, uh, representative. And I think that, 
almost all of my takeaways. I'm not even all that wound up about the truckers. I mean, there's been so much discussion about it. Uh, and I mean, I, 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 I'll stick to pure politics. And, and I agree with you guys. Um, there is a smug tone. I said repeatedly in the last couple of days on other media platforms, I think the government's got to be very careful. And the prime minister pers- personally and specifically should be careful um, uh, to not look exploitative uh, in this moment, because I think that the biggest takeaway here is that the Conservative Party, led by a handful of members of Parliament, tried to exploit this whole thing. They decided to invite the association with this movement, with these truckers, and they fucking own it. And I don't, and they can, you can talk about Denis Coderre and all this, but you can't have it both ways because all these people are also saying, oh, well, that's not representative, a few bad apples. Well, the whole goddamn barrel looked pretty rough to me. I'm sure there's some red delicious in there. But my real, my, my real outrage, though, is I, I have to say, and, and I, I, you know, there's a whole, the conservatives invited this association. They celebrated this. And what were they celebrating? They were celebrating, you know, the, the freedom of people to not get vaccinated, the freedom of people to not protect themselves, their neighbors, their families, and yes, strangers. And I don't think there's any... Um, I don't think there's any triumph in that. I don't think there's anything to be proud about that. I have to say, and I know he's a good friend of yours, Jenny, but I was I was, I was, was angered by two things from Pierre Polyev in particular this past uh, few days. First, him waging around this hashtag vaccine vendetta. I think that's shameful. Vaccines are a miracle cure. They've saved tons of lives. They are our best route out of this goddamn pandemic. And if you're frustrated about lockdowns, well, that's the route out of it. So to c- characterize them as a vendetta or to suggest they're being used as vendetta, I think that's a denigration of the miracle that are those vaccines. And it really burns my my fucking berry. The second thing is when he wheeled with so much talent, I don't, and we'll come to this when it comes to leadership talk, guys got tons of game, so much more than an O'Toole. But the way in which he harnessed his game, when he wheeled on CPAC and that clip on those steps and full of self-righteous indignation after being called on the invitation that he extended to all those truckers and all those people that do look extreme, after he extended that invitation, then to say, I'm standing with those who put groceries on our table and how dare you, this whole, you know, I'm a working class guy and if you are against me, you're against the working class, go fuck a kite, okay? I, I got no time for that. And that's that, that I think is there is something really fundamental in this populist, ugly, I'm going to feed people's grievances back to them, exploit it for political purposes. And the reason I think the prime minister should be so careful not to be smug, not to be exploitative on this question, is that Pierre Polyev and other conservative MPs absolutely sought to exploit this for political gain. It blew up in their face. Now they're trying to diminish and deflect it. And I don't think they're going to be very successful at it because we all saw what we saw and they're going to wear some of it. Well, we've seen the polls out. I know that that everyone's saying that ever Canadians are against uh, the, our Canadians are against uh, uh, the uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 trucker the pro, the protests. In, uh, uh, and uh, I saw Innovation had a poll out this morning, David. Uh, it's a small one, but uh, so forty six percent of pardon me. 30 percent support the thirty one percent. Is that what I saw? 30, yeah, thirty one percent support the convoy. Forty six percent don't, and eighteen percent. Um, uh, 18% don't. So I, I, I'm not sure, Scott, like what you're talking in terms of, I don't think anything's blowing up in anyone's face. I think that where people are right now is, is there was the protest on the weekend. Um, there are people still there, but I don't, it's, they're obviously not the representative or seem to be the vast majority. I think most people came, they did their protest, they've gone back to work. They've, um, uh, they've, um, where's the evidence of that, Jenny? I, I, I mean, literally, I mean, the, the, the conservatives, the have, to the the conservatives have to have to force us to entertain a improbable string of butt knots, but not the people who pissed on the cenotaph, but not the people who charged into a homeless shelter, but not the people that forced small businesses to close, but not the people that fl- uh, flew the swastika, but why not the people that bullied them, others. Why, why do you think it hurt them as opposed to just, I think the point Jenny's making is that they it just reinforced existing positions. You know, forty six percent didn't like it. Thirty one percent liked it. That kind of feels like, like this is this a is this is like, uh-huh. my my feeling is the liberals and the media want to focus on the protest when I think that the big story here is what I've said before is that this country is very divided in terms it's of not. where it's standing. It it is Scott. It, it is isn't very divided. Ninety percent of people are vaccinated. Ninety percent of truckers are vaccinated. People overwhelmingly support vaccines and vaccine mandates. It's not overwhelmingly divided. And when but conservatives not, but say is, that, they're Scott, trying to what, perpetuate Scott, this notion for their own political benefit. Scott, this is because you never fucking listen to what I'm saying. This isn't. 
I just do. about vaccine mandates. This is this is not just about vaccine mandates. It is about what I'm telling. It is about uh, people upset with school closures. It, they're upset with lockdowns. They are upset with the hypocrisy of. I'm uh, upset with school closures. And I don't stand with some asshole who pisses on the tomb of the unknown soldier. So don't conflate those things. No, but Scott, when you say the country isn't divided, there's there's some conflicting signals now because you're right. The uh, country isn't des- really divided on vaccination. 90% of the people got it. And I think most people got it not begrudgingly, but happily. Um, and, but on the other hand, uh, there was a, a poll out yesterday. I think it was by Angus Reid. It got pretty wide circulation. It doesn't have per- perhaps as precise wording in the question as you might like. I don't mean to disparage it, but I just mean to limit perhaps what you can read into it. But there was a very large number of Canadians that were sort of like, let me get on with my life and let those people get on with their deaths or whatever it is that they want to have happen to them. Um, it's like the, the notion that we all should be doing one thing together now does seem to be breaking down. Yeah, I'm not shocked by that. But I mean, there remains until we see the, uh, you know, the virulence of this thing really dissipate. And we don't know if there will be another variant and what its potency will be. But there remains a social obligation. I mean, it's easy for me to say, it's easier for, I got an, almost got in a yelling match where the guy refused to yell his, wear his mask at an arena last night when the first day back for hockey practice. And this 14-year-old girl is supposed to be policing the front of the arena asking for QR codes. This guy's yelling and screaming at her. And you kind of go, well, like part of me goes, I just want to let that guy just fuck off. But what if, what if because of that guy, six kids get sick? sick? So, I mean, until we're at a point where we feel very comfortable about the virulence, I, I'm, I, I think a lot of people are less resigned about this and they're but, still but anxious. Scott- but Scott, the reason people are, but but people are becoming less anxious. The poll that David cited, fifty four percent now are are are, do, are done with QR codes. They're done with uh, lockdowns. They're done with all of it, and that's up. I think significantly. What was it up, David? Significantly from even a month ago. And so, fifteen Scott, points. I think, watching, think it was up fifteen points. Well, but, yeah, but so me people, too. But, but if but the Scott, virulence can I finish? Increases. So, Can I finish? Yeah, like, you're okay. the only one talking virulence. Everyone, look at the UK has moved on. They're they are like no mandates anymore. The UK hasn't announced it. Denmark has announced it. Canada, especially Ontario and Quebec, remain this bizarre little microcosm of what we're the only ones that that the virulence could all, like another virulent could come that will be over and above. I don't know. Are you will, an epidemiologist all of a sudden? I mean, what if there's no, but, a, there's going to be Scott, another problem, variant, and we problem, don't know that it will be less potent. But, but you? Scott, the problem, the, pr- the problem that uh, the problem that people have now, it's like Ontario has said, we're going back to normal. The, the issue that they ha- people have, and I think the reason why uh, support for going back to normal is as strong as it is, is now every COVID is not abstract to, any, to most people now. It was abstract six months ago, even three months ago to a lot of people. But what Omer Khan did is everyone has gotten it. Everyone has known someone that's gotten it. I I know people that gotten it have gotten it, and all but like two of the people, like out of fifty people I know, they were all vaccinated at least twice, and some of them three times. And so so people are just like, okay, we're vaccinated, we're not going to get us sick. Um, if you don't want to get vaccinated and you get sick, that's kind of your problem. But we're going to go on with our life because everyone else around the world is going on with their life. That is the frustration. Well, that Jenny, is it not the have. case, Jenny? Is it not the case that the reason that Ontario and Quebec are these kind of different approaches and, and the Canada generally is a different approach is that from the beginning in Canada, this policy has been about protecting the healthcare system from being overrun. And that still remains a prospect in these provinces. And so what's happening is that now these two things are coming into conflict is people aren't worried so much about themselves anymore. And so they want to be free from this, but the government's, still have to worry about the number of people flooding into the hospitals. And so I think that there's a, this is a problem for governments in explaining to people why these mandates still have to be in place. Well, but we had hospital, we had, we were at hospital capacity, most, a lot of flu seasons. If you go back uh, 10 years, uh, we were at, at capacity uh, or, or over capacity uh, in general flu seasons uh, prior to, uh, prior to COVID. And I think what other, what then Canadians would say is, okay, we have been doing this now for 23 months, 23 months. It'll be 24 months, two years next month. Why do we still then have a problem with capacity? 32 people died in Ontario yesterday. I mean, I I hate lockdowns as much as the next person. 
more. But um, I was delighted that my kid could go to hockey last night. I was really excited for him to get back on the ice. Um, but 32 people died yesterday in Ontario. Like, it's still happening. Is he vaxxed? Hmm? Ben is he is. vaxxed? Ben's double vaxxed, yeah. Ben is? Yeah. So are you worried about Ben? Uh, you know, I try not to let that enter my head too much. He's double vaxxed. I, you know, it's, it's in keeping with the discussion. So my hope is that the nature of Omicron is such that it, even if you were to catch it, it probably isn't that going to be that debilitating. But at the back of your mind, you're always thinking as a parent, what, what if, what if I'm the 1%? What if he's the 1%? Um, you know, but again, I, I mean, I, I, I'm not arguing for lockdowns. What I'm saying is that we can we can pound the table and there can be large numbers of people, large percentages of people that are frustrated about the lockdowns. And I would include myself in that if a poll uh, was conducted. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the threat has absented itself. Right. There'll be new variants. There's no guarantee. It's <coughs> not like Scott, Scott, do you think it's do you think it's coming to a do you think that it's coming to a head on top of a whole bunch of other anger? Right. Like, we've had two elections now that should have been about the cost of living, and neither one of them was. But that's what was been on people's minds. There's been a lot of financial stress out there. Then COVID comes along. I mean, I think the population's fucking unhappy. I think right? so, too. And the government doesn't seem to be addressing any of the things that are making them unhappy, and late, laterally are doing things that make them deliberately make them unhappy. I mean, I think people are fucking frustrated with a lot of things, and as COVID hits the two-year mark, as Jenny says, and people have vaxxed and masked and everything, they've done their bit, they're like, this, this shit is just not working for me in a broad range. Don't you feel that? Of course I feel that. I feel that personally. Yeah. See it in my daily life. I've got lots of friends who are middle-aged like us, Dave, who are, you know, suddenly feeling... Depressed, anxious, all that stuff. You know, I mean, it's dragging people down. This stuff isn't made up and people talk about all the sort of mental health kind of, you know, pandemic that's also occurring. But, you know, I, that doesn't mean that, you know, the, let's call on the Senate and the Governor General to overthrow all three orders of government as articulated by Canada Unity or whatever. It doesn't mean that that's, that that's representative of those of course, people. Of so. course, that's, but that's ridiculous. But at the end of the, like, so what we're talking about, we're back on COVID now, which, um, but last year at this time, uh, people had hope because we were just starting to get, uh, vaccinations were just start, like starting in Canada. It was like this time next year, once we're vaxxed, um, this will be over. And what people are seeing now, it's the same. You know, we're all, I think probably, we're all got our booster. We're probably all three vaxxed on 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 uh, on this show. Every and, and to your point, David, it's with the 23 months and we've masked, we've vaccinated. We're, we're one of the most vaccinated countries in the entire world. We're like close to 90% fully vaccinated across the country. And yet the two biggest provinces are still sitting essentially with the same up until you know, yesterday in Ontario are still sitting with the exact same lockdown policies that we were when not when when less than five percent of us were vaxxed. Because if you're in government, you have a higher obligation to say, well, golly gee, if people who actually are able to take out the measuring tape and track this stuff tell me that there's a very real possibility that the healthcare system may get fractured, then I got to act in defense of that. Like you just have no uh, no alternative. Like, uh, so, so should the government be I clear be about, about that, that I, if that if that is the reality, should they be clear about that? Like, should they say, you know what, if this was just about you and your personal health, we'd fucking let you go right. and sort it out yourselves. But we still have this fucking problem, which is that we can't have our ICUs overrun. And so that is clearly what this is about now. But I don't think they can say that. But I don't think they can say that, David, because then they're admitting. So then the next question is, OK, this was why we had two weeks to flatten the curve so our hospitals wouldn't be overwhelmed in March, the mid-March of 2020. Now governments have had governments have had almost two years to make sure that our hospitals aren't overrun because we did have a shortage. We we did have capacity issues prior to COVID. So 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 now that we're into this living with COVID, the, if they admit that, David, the question then comes to them is, well, what the fuck have you guys actually been doing for the last 23 months? Like, yeah, I guess I think that people and, and yeah, some of it will stick to you. It's a danger if you're in government for sure. Right. And you have to be anxious about it. I mean, we see it sticking to all sorts of provincial governments. On the other hand, I think that people are kind of reasonable. And they know that when you throw a cannonball into the healthcare system, uh, you know, it's going to knock over equipment 
and break some glass. So I, I, I mean, I, I, I think the people recognize that it, I mean, what were you supposed to do? You're supposed to build a healthcare system that, that, that is structured around avoiding a once in a century pandemic. Like I, you know, you kind of got to plug your way through it. I mean, I sound like I'm defending Doug Ford again. This is you I always accusing me of, Jenny. But uh, your you friend Doug, <laughs> your friend, at least, you, at least you don't just call him by his first name anymore. That was a period I really disliked. That was the, that, that may be my least favorite part of the pandemic was when Scott liked Doug Ford. I think that <laughs> is. <laughs> I used to, we used to meet behind Queens Park there in that uh, open bay, you know, like for, and I call him D-Dog and we'd share a smoke. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> so pretty soon it'll be two years since we were all pulled into this whirlpool of a pandemic two years remember the early scares the toilet paper shortages the sanitizer shortages the job losses the stock market crash and rebound back in early 2020 people had no idea where it was all headed and you know some fears were justified Turns out those overseas supply chains we rely on so heavily are pretty fragile. But within North America, the fuel and the minerals and the manufactured goods and grain and the livestock and groceries and all the other things upon which our way of life depends have kept moving. Even the cargo from abroad that does manage to make it to our seaports reaches stores and consumers in timely fashion. And no company is more vital to keeping our domestic supply chains flowing smoothly than our sponsor, CN. If you've got it, a train probably brought it. From day one of the pandemic, CN employees have been reporting for work and keeping our economy moving. During those long months when the US-Canada border was closed to most of us, CN trains kept rolling and rolling on time, heading down through the American heartland to the Gulf of Mexico and back. They still are. Our weather is changing too, to put it mildly. Last winter was harsh. And we've already gone through a few tough months this winter. But you know, CN knows how to deal with deep cold and ice. The C in CN does stand for Canadian. Last summer brought disastrous heat and wildfires. Scientists are predicting more in the year to come. Ultimately, though, CN's trains will run on time. They simply have to. We all have plenty to worry about nowadays. Life is getting more expensive. Everything is more complicated. We still don't know where the pandemic is going. But when we do get to the other side, it will be because CN's trains helped get us there. That you can count on. So last night, I'm sitting on the couch, getting ready for bed, watching Vera on BritBox. And along across Twitter comes a bomb. A bomb from Bob Fife and Marika Walsh. Hey, and didn't Globe we talk about them before? Didn't we talk about both we, of them before? We may have talked about, we may have talked about them before. Yes, and they turned um, pitches and around and put them out of the park. They had this story that 35 conservative MPs have signed a letter asking for a vote on Aaron O'Toole's leadership, which under the Reform Act, which the Conservative Party has adopted, mandates the caucus to have a vote on the leadership. And if a majority, uh, if a majority votes for one, then O'Toole is done immediately. Some interesting things in the article I will point out one of which is that O'Toole immediately had backspin, immediately had backspin that it was all about the conversion therapy vote. So he was trying to discredit his opponents by saying that they were all advocates of conversion therapy, and that's why they were angry at him. There was also, and I'd be interested in Jenny's take on this, some reference to intimidating phone calls that an emissary, James Bezin, had made on behalf of O'Toole to caucus members that seemed to backfire on them somewhat. And then last is the very weird role in all this of Andrew Scheer. Some reports that he wants to be the interim leader, some reports that he's behind the coup against O'Toole. Um, I sort of thought the guy was uh, dead and gone in Canadian politics, but maybe maybe he had different maybe he had different ideas. So it is obvious, as Jenny has been telling the accursed for some time, <laughs> that O'Toole is done. So what's next? Jenny, do you want to go first or do you want to react to Scott? Uh, let Scott go first. I'll react. Well, 
<laughs> I mean, Jenny knows so much more about this than I do. So I, I, I mean, first of all, I, I hadn't thought as much about Andrew Shear, but if he's leading the palace coup, I guess I got to switch my money to the palace. Fuck, because uh, that guy, <laughs> that guy won't finish that job. Um, look, I, I um, here's the thing that I took away that I thought was most interesting, just like the pure fun politics of it. So I think. But I was really fascinated by O'Toole's Twitter thread last night where he comes out charging. It had the feeling like they knew this thing was coming. They knew a grenade was going to be thrown at them. They had a whole narrative. And what I like about it, what I what, what I, mean, I like, I mean, what I'm wha- wicked ass entertained by. Because, um, of course, this is all sport. Nobody's lives actually are involved or whatever, right? I'm just a fucking ghoul. But what I'm wicked ass entertained by is... That he immediately positions himself, as you say, with the conversion therapy and all that kind of stuff, right? He invokes, you know, uh, Sloan and Randy Hillier, right? He that's so he immediately tries to present that's the alternative of the debate. That's the other side of this divide here, um, and he presents himself as this sort of a noble figure who is trying desperately to tug the conservative party back to a more rational, reasonable, mainstream position and keep it away. From the mongrel dogs who would drag it into the crazy ditch of extremism. And 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 that's interesting. And that narrative is going to be told and we're going to have all kinds of stuff. And I myself have a lot of uh, opinions that lots of people will it hate. It would be about. more compelling, so. Scott. It would be more compelling if I had any fucking idea what Aaron O'Toole believes. Bingo! This is where you get. And this is, so this is the point I would make and then I'll shut up because I want to hear from Jenny. <laughs> How can he present himself? As the champion of mainstream, mainstream, rational, let's save ourselves from ourselves, conservatives, when he won the leadership with the support of people like Sloan and Leslin Lewis, where he campaigned as a true blue, right? And, you know, so this guy has, he's wrapped himself in so many differing wardrobes since he became leader and was running for leader. It's a joke. He's not. It's it, he's not a champion of anything. He stands for nothing. That weakness, that um, that 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 chameleon like instinct to shift every time the debate moves, um, I think, is condemning, and it will make his preferred defense of his leadership risible because nobody thinks that he's actually uh, stands and represents a wing of the party. He doesn't represent any wing of anything, and that's the failure of his leadership. I think. He represents himself and that's it. And, and we saw it last week. We, there were a lot happened actually within co- the conservative movement within the party, actually, since we last um, since we last uh, uh, met, of course, uh, not to go back to the trucker thing. Aaron did have seemingly four positions in five days, uh, depending uh, depending on what the day was. And then you had the long awaited uh, report to uh, caucus. And then ended the- up with a Lipton's cup of soup fucking position. Right. Which is I'll meet with some guys somewhere. Fuck anyway. Anybody, yeah. I don't, you can't take a picture of me with them. <laughs> um, I'm behind and, the Burger uh, King with some people who claim to be truckers. It was a great meeting. I'm really with them. <laughs> and wow. then you had, and then you had, of course, the election report that came out, and he he had staked a lot. His people had staked a lot on this report in terms of uh, what happened in the last election, and and. Basically, what it what it came out to say was Aaron wasn't really responsible for anything. Um, the, 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 the problems with the leader were he spent too much time in the studio. Um, he was too scripted and he seemed inauthentic. So the only one that's actually the Aaron problem is inauthentic. And that's a nice way of saying um, uh, that's a nice way of saying Aaron just lies all the time uh, and changes his position. The other two were actually tactics. And and it also bizarrely blamed the the platform of the 2015 election campaign on them losing uh, seats in ethnic communities uh, in 2021, despite the fact that we won those seats that he lost in 2015. Andrew won those seats in 2019. He lost them. I guess I guess the issue just leapfrogged over, you know, seven years, two leaders and, and uh, two elections. And so there was just no credibility. The, the report also um, the report also had a conclusion that basically Aaron O'Toole was best fit to uh, lead the party, which I've I've been part of a lot of postmortems uh, for election campaigns, um, local campaigns, leadership campaigns, what have you. There's never a conclusion quite that definitive within uh, uh, within the report, and so um, that was kind of the start of kind of the bad uh, the bad week in terms of like his messaging. Uh, in terms of his messaging uh, yesterday, um, if I was his office, I would be sick to my stomach that at least thirty percent of my caucus have publicly come out and said that. Um, 
they don't want you as leader or they want to review as, as, uh, as leader. And so, um, the, the tack to take then to say that basically everyone that is against me, you're either with me or against me. And if you're against me, you don't care about the party. You want to be the NDP of the left, um, or the, or the NDP of the right. Um, you guys are supporting Derek Sloan. I'm just going to point out for the record, there was only one person in our caucus that voted to keep Derek Sloan in caucus when he was removed. And that was Aaron O'Toole. So it goes back to the, con- the, the, the continued lying to just try to get through the day. Uh, it, this has nothing to do with uh, uh, conversion therapy. This has nothing to do with Andrew Shear wanting to be interim leader. That is absolutely ridiculous. This is them grasping at straws to try to, uh, uh, to try to keep their leadership. And everything they do is just making it harder, easier and easier for people uh, that want him gone, that he'll be gone. There are caucus members that after they saw his statement, so divisive, uh, that were like, this is the same. He's using the exact same words that Justin Trudeau used earlier today. And there are people that were sympathetic and yesterday would have voted to save his leadership that are going to vote against him because of that. So there, there's a there's a download. I'm sure I'm missing stuff. Can can I ask one quick fact? That's awesome. I was going to say my my favorite part of the report that I read was that his uh, O'Toole's personal performance in the campaign was universally praised, according yeah. to the debate uh, report, universally praised, which means that Cumming did not listen to the curse of politics during the campaign, <laughs> or he would not have been able to claim that O'Toole's performance was universally praised. Well, and besides I want to the point out how is- terrible O'Toole's situation is. Like this, 35 members of caucus signing a letter like this is so unusual to have the open opposition of a third or more of your caucus like this is like this is far worse than anything that Clark ever faced far worse than anything that Turner ever faced and when when it got to this point for Jean Chrétien the prime minister felt he couldn't carry on okay so O'Toole is done, done, fucking done. I don't even care what happens with the vote this week. He's not going to be able to carry on with this many people in his caucus, this opposed to his leadership. Can I, yes. can I throw in one thought on this? That people, because I was joking earlier about, ah, oh, this is all just sports and tactics to us. But, but you do take one step back for fo- folks like ourselves who've been involved in politics, for folks like ourselves who've been through leadership scraps. Um, I want to underline what you said there, right? 35 members of your caucus, what's that? 25 to 30% of his caucus have signed a letter. People don't recognize there's a human dimension to this. These folks sit in rooms with Aaron O'Toole, right? They have supported Aaron O'Toole. They've knocked on doors and said, please vote for Aaron O'Toole. I think he's the best person to be prime minister. Yes, he's my friend, right? They have to look at Aaron O'Toole. It is an awkward and significant thing to ask somebody that interacts with Aaron O'Toole to sign a piece of paper saying, I think he needs to be thrown aside. It's very difficult. So if 35 have, have taken that step that and they've come to that interpersonal sort of judgment of, yep, I'm willing to do that. I know I'll look him in the face. I know I'll encounter him. I have to say, sorry, Aaron, you got to go. Like, there's another 25 that couldn't bring themselves, that couldn't summon the courage, that were looking to say, well, who else is in this pool? Are, am I, have I got lots of, you know, the, 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 that's the tip of the iceberg. And I'm not saying that it means that everyone in the caucus is opposed to him. I'm sure they're champions, all that stuff. But if you get 35% in a dynamic like that, of people who are willing to look him in the eye and say, I'm done with you, there's a lot more people that are going to go, oh. Oh, so he is cooked like a Christmas goose, as you say, David. And it's uh, and 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 I uh, last thought. No, he can't run this defense of his leadership, which is based on listen. Th- those are the extremists. I have to save the party from itself. For God's sake, you all know me to be a mainstream. Call me a red Tory if you like. I'll take that mantle now, right? And I have to save the party from itself. He can't play that because a he's not being that, right? And b I'm not sure the party wants that. I don't think the party wants that. So he's also, I mean, that may sound good to columnists, that argument, but I don't think it's going to play with the caucus, with the membership. I mean, and that suggests other problems that the party may have going forward. But I mean, I just think it fails on every front. The guy is boned. 
Well, he, he ran a campaign based on that. And it, and, and we, and we did, we did portably like this. It goes back to, to my point of, you know, the, the claim that, well, you could be the, the you know, the, the people in the party, uh, you could say the Jenny Burns just want to be the NDP of the right. Uh, well, actually we have, we govern, we have governed for the majority that this party has been in existence. Okay. So tell us this, Jenny. He didn't run, Jenny, I'm just going to, I'm going to interject because as somebody that has generally been of the view that a more moderate conservative party is a more electable conservative party. He didn't try that. It was farcical what they did. Right. Um, I mean, we talked, but we talked about it, David. It's why I, why, what what did I say during the entire leadership race? What was was Aaron O'Toole's problem? Truth into authenticity, integrity. So, so Jenny, what, 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 um, Let's not talk necessarily today. I mean, maybe we can. I don't know if you want to go here, Dave. But I mean, before we jump into leadership candidates and all that sort of stuff, just walk us through this next, this next handful of days. Like, we've all underlined how significant thirty-five signatures are. We've all talked about the fact that there must be a bunch of others. So there's going to be a caucus meeting. Um, like, how, like what, what, what unfolds tomorrow? Does, tomorrow. So, so does he literally stumble out of there and said, look, there's a vote. I lost a vote. I'm calling. A, I, I, I'm going to we're going to have a leadership. I'm going to be a I'm going to be a candidate in it. Does he say uh, does he throw in the towel and say, you know what? Um, you know, uh, we're in the 15th round and Ali's got one more punch left in him. So I'm going to I'm 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 giving up like what? How does it unfold? What do you think will occur? So this is new because uh, I'm I, the same as you. Anytime that I've been part or w- witnessed some of like you've been part of watching this, it's never been through the Reform Act. So so I will echo the fact that when you have 35 people in your caucus that are willing to put their name on something, it's 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 not like how I've seen things transpire, like what went down with stock with the alliance. It's just once you get a critical mass, it just happens. So 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 this is unique for our party. My understanding is what will happen is this will go to a secret ballot uh, within caucus on on Wednesday. And I guess what we'll see today is um, I guess. I guess we'll, we'll see back and forth. I'm sure from all sides, uh, all sides today. As you said, Aaron had had James Bazan making ham fistedly making uh, making calls to uh, um, calls to people. Uh, he seems to be the only one because they're st- they're sticking with their tradition. It seems to not actually directly speak with caucus, um, which has worked well for them over the last. Uh, um, which has worked well for them after the last uh, uh, six months. Um, and I think that they'll probably throw a Hail Mary. Someone sent me a um, a website for this mo- grassroots movement called the Majority Movement or something. I'll send it to you guys. That was basically like a, a kidnap video of, of some guy talking about how his third party organization is, is, is going to be there to help Aaron O'Toole um, uh, win a majority, which I thought the actual party apparatus was. I, th- I felt that was the job of the of the party. I didn't think they needed a third party group to kind of endorse that. I, I just but maybe I've been wrong all these years in terms of what one of the <laughs> objectives of a, of, a, of, a, of a political party is. Uh, and so I think you'll see back and forth with that. But I think that you know, as we said, I think there is a cr- critical mass of people that genuinely want him gone for, for different reasons. I'm sure everyone has a different reason. I think authenticity and, and the direction of the party, we're, we're pretty much rudderless. Like he's he's not really the lead. He's the leader in name only. Like he's the leader right now on the letterhead and he's the leader like living in Stornoway. And that pretty much is um, uh, that pretty much is uh, that pretty much is it. And then you have the people that might like him that go, this is not sustainable. And so I think what will happen and we'll see is that there will be a vote on there'll be a vote on Wednesday and then he will be removed as the um, as the leader of the parliamentary caucus. And then I'm, I'm assuming the, the the official party stuff after that. And, and I think that like probably the first act after he if he loses the vote will be uh, will be the election of an interim leader, because I think there's a less than zero percent chance that the caucus uh, would uh, would allow um, him to stay on as interim leader like they did Andrew after he uh, he stepped down. The difference being Andrew was very well liked um, uh, within uh, within caucus and uh, Aaron evidently is not. Hey, Jenny, can I ask you a question that just occurred to me while you were talking, which is, if it's possible to divorce this from Aaron, from attitudes about a tool personally, how does the party, because, you know, the Reform Party started a very grassroots enterprise. How does the party feel about the fact that the caucus can remove a leader they selected? 
Well, listen, I think the vast majority of members that I know are going to be actually relieved um, that this is uh, that this is happening. I'm sure some uh, some will not. But this was this. Listen, this was one of the arguments that people like me had when uh, when the when we when the Chong bill went through in terms of uh, in terms of the when the Reform Act went through it, 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 it isn't up to caucus to to decide whether someone should be a leader or not. Um, uh, it's up to the party. And so um, there are a whole host of reasons why I was I, I didn't like the idea that a leader couldn't remove someone from caucus, that it actually is a vote, the, the said vote about Derek Sloan, where Aaron O'Toole was the lone Sloan supporter. Um, and so um, it, 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 I don't think there is going to be much, there is going to be many people upset with this, uh, David, to be honest. Um, I think it's going to be mostly a sense of uh, a sense of relief, but it is, it's, it's very ironic that, you know, uh, Mike Chong, who is one of Aaron's only supporters, it was, it was this, this was his creation. And Aaron, of course, was one of the uh, biggest advocates of the Reform Act uh, within caucus, especially after the 2015 and 2019 campaigns. It's, it's very ironic, uh, the position that, uh, uh, that he, that they find themselves in, uh, find themselves in right now. For sure. So Jerry Butts says that Doug Ford's the man to watch now that O'Toole has done. Doug Ford, conservative leader, is he in that race? Well, I don't, it, I guess we'll see what the party decides in terms of the leadership race. My assumption, and most people I've talked to want a fairly quick leadership race, that they, uh, we are in a minority government. Um, they felt that we've been kind of rudderless for the last six months. They, they don't really want a long, drawn out uh, process. And Doug's got an election coming up in four months now. So I can't see from a practical point of view how he would be able to, even if it was after the, the election, um, uh, after the election, uh, be able to run. Well, that, dumping their leader four months before the election worked last time. That is that is uh, that is that is that is fair. This would be different. Though. I'm, not, <laughs> I'm 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 not sure that uh, I'm not sure that uh, I, I I I'm not sure that that would be politically uh, that would be politically smart for. Uh, um, I don't think that would be politically smart for uh, for Doug. I know there's a lot of people that are uh, talking about it. I'm sure there's a lot of people that will see it. But the the, the Conservative Party of Canada and the uh, PC Party of Ontario are are very different uh, uh, are very different parties. I think that the uh, um, the membership uh, the membership for the most part they're on board board meet on, like at the board level uh, can be the same. But um, uh, Doug would be someone coming at it with with no infrastructure uh, from anywhere else across the country outside of Ontario. I thought it was a good take. I've said it myself in the past before. I think that Doug Ford, I, I, I have, you know, interacted with the guy for over a decade now and having to deal with him at the radio station back when his brother was mayor and stuff. I, I, I think these guys have had their own sort of Etobicoke sense of manifest destiny. Um, I think that he sees himself as a future prime minister. I think he's really tempted. I think he thinks he's got the uh, fastest, slickest, sturdiest uh, hot rod in the conservative movement today with Ford Nation. And I think he'll be sorely tempted. And there's a hundred reasons that everything Jenny says makes perfect sense. Like I, a bunch of reasons we'd say, well, you wouldn't want to trade that possibility for the position you have and all the, all that kind of stuff. But I think he'll be sorely tempted. And uh, I think, you know, there'll be people saying to him, look, there's a choice, you know, like the conservative party um, can be smart, mean populace, or we can be, Dumb, friendly populace. Come on, Doug. Let's be dumb, <laughs> friendly populace. And I think it'll be very tempting. Well, I think that I think the talk for uh, potential leadership candidates, maybe that's for for next week's pod, David, because it's I it's I will repeat again. No one is talking about anything past the vote, uh, uh, past the vote tomorrow in caucus. So caucus is in the morning by by noon, uh, by noon tomorrow. I guess we will see whether uh, Aaron O'Toole will will limp out of caucus um, bruised and bloody. I don't think he survives the vote for all of the reasons that we have talked about. Um, but even if he does, he's essentially uh, he's he's essentially done. But I don't I, I just don't see i just don't see him surviving based on any of the conversations that i've been having i know we're running out of time but one last if, question. if i was on the national executive or the board or whatever you call it national council yeah national council if i was on, if i was an unaligned member of the national council i would be arguing for a very long race i would be arguing not that we need to be ready for an election in a matter of months because there won't be one and we're not ready to force one uh, I mean, the conservatives aren't ready to force one. And I would want a long race 
to really hash out what the party's about through the leadership. That's generally how these things happen. That's generally how parties decide where they want to position themselves and what they want to stand for is through their selection of leader. And I think that the Conservative Party needs a good long discussion about that. Um, and I don't prejudge where they where they end up on it. Um, and they there's a lot of considerations, electoral, ideological, all kinds of things. But I think that I think that you know the exercise they went through the last time, where a guy ran promising to be one thing and was kind of able to get away with that because it wasn't really tested and it was a shadow race, didn't serve the party well. And I think that. Um, you know, Scott, to our to our disadvantage, not to our disadvantage, because it was done by, I mean, the long leadership race in the Liberal Party in 89-90, despite the fact that we lost, clarified a lot of things inside the party. Yeah, it right? actually did. I think that's, I mean, people maybe will forget all that, but I think it did. I think it, um, it gave the party all the time in the world to conclude that it did want Jean Chrétien, right? And that it that it, it sort of sort out how it felt about Meech and constitutional politics, sort out the fact that it wanted to put it behind itself, right? Um, like, I, I, yeah. I, I do think that's right. And we ended up, we ended up poorly positioned. Um, as, as that clarity emerged, it emerged to our disadvantage. But... Um, but there's a lot of merit in giving a party time to think that through and feel about how it feels about itself. Yeah, I think arg arguments can be made both ways. When Stephen Harper was elected, it was a three month uh, it was a three month leadership race, and it was very substantive in terms of talking about direction of the party um, uh, as well as substantive policy issues. I guess problem the question is the always is how much discussion happens before the core decisions made, like before the membership cutoff or the supporter cutoff or the delegates are selected, right? Normally, those things happen relatively early, and so the discussion afterwards is kind of irrelevant. Um, well, there's you know, the another conservatives in 1993 spent much of the race in the last two months trying to undo what had been done in the delegate selection early right. in the race. Right, trying to listen. At the end of the day, we can talk. Like, the, the issue wasn't length of the leadership race last time. It was the fact that um, Aaron lied, and Aaron went out there and presented himself as someone he was not, thinking that he was duping a bunch of conservatives across the country. And a lot of conservatives across the country felt duped um, because they didn't know much of him. So it was there was the first time they were seeing Aaron O'Toole. Anyone that knew Aaron and anyone had who had worked with him or had known him and ideologically knew where he he stood um, knew that what he was what he was presenting was a false bill of goods. So then, so so it, it wouldn't have mattered whether it was a year long, David, or it wouldn't have mattered if it was. Two months long. The fact of the matter is, is Aaron um, uh, Aaron misrepresented who he was to the membership. So I, I think that it's. I don't. I, I think in terms of timing, I don't think it doesn't matter. I think what what conservative members are going to be looking for is they're they're going to be really doing a deep dive into like it's it it will be it will be more difficult. Um, it will be more difficult for 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 someone to like people's people's current people's past and current, what they say in the leadership race is, is going to be a lot more scrutiny on it than probably any leadership race that I've been, uh, I've watched for any of our parties. So, um, but I mean, I, to all of this, I'll just how, how committed is O'Toole to fighting for his leadership? Because it alters the discussion the party has around leadership. If O'Toole makes himself the central figure of it. Like if he says, if he comes to a microphone on Tuesday or Wednesday, Wednesday before the vote as an example, and says, you know what, we're going to have a vote. I'm not going to have that vote. Piss on the vote. I've written a letter to the National Council. I'm asking for a leadership contest and I intend to be a candidate. And the reason is that even if I win this vote, and I think I will, I can't really carry forward and unite my caucus and my party if one third of it says that they're dedicated to seeing me leave and therefore we need to settle this question. Sort of Joe Clarkish. And if he does that, then is there as much room for that broader discussion or does it end up being about, uh, okay, well, we got to put the last couple bullets in this guy. Um, you know, like what, do we have a sense? I, I saw his Twitter thread, but uh, you know, I only put so much stock in it. So, you know, is he going to fight for his leadership? Does he really it want seems to fight like for it? it. I, I, I see no indication that he's not going to fight for it. Like I, I would like, then his know, only play like, is to call it. Like, I mean, we said this over and over again, but walking into that uh, caucus and letting people fill him with bullets doesn't make any sense. He, they, no, listen, the Clark I'm, thing is instructive. 
The Clark thing is instructive because when Clark decided to run again in 83, when he called the leadership and decided he was going to run in it, he started off as the prohibitive favorite over a, a cast of people of which Mulroney was one, but by far not the only one. Um, uh, Crosby was in there. There were tons of, Michael Wilson was in there. David, tons of prominent people. And Clark started off with 40%. And everybody else started off with 10%. And, and, and Clark had 40% the day he announced he was running for leader. And on the final ballot of the leadership convention, Clark had 40%. And the 60% had just coalesced. That's what had happened over the course of the race and the balloting, right? So, you know, if you don't think that you've got a majority going in, and if you did, you would be, if you did, you wouldn't be in this kind of situation. There's no way, I don't think there's any way to win it from O'Toole's position. He's... If yeah, it goes think, to a vote, if it goes to a vote, he's going to lose. It's just a question of time. When. Uh, if you remember, I think it was two weeks ago on the pod. I said, if I was Aaron O'Toole, the only like if you want a, a hail mary pass to stay leader even for the next six months, the yeah. only way it was when the first it was when the first riding associations came out and said that uh, they wanted a leadership review. His hail mary pass would have then been to say, you want to know something? Let's move up the let's move up the uh, leadership review vote. I'll stay as opposition leader. I'll t I'll show you all how wonderful and great I am and why I should stay. And that I don't think it would have worked for him but but that was the only hail mary he had and and i think what we have seen every step of the way is every time he does something we talk about what we would have done different and i think what we would have done different was right but he seems to have every step of the way done the exact opposite um in terms of of what logically i, I would look at trying to keep his job okay one last quick troublemaking question can maxine bernier take out a conservative party membership and can he on the basis of that membership, present himself as a candidate for the leadership if there's a race. No, I don't. The, the party would never allow that. Well, don't set us. I'm asking a technical question. Like, set aside the prospects that he would have. Right? I actually don't. But can listen, can I he don't actually know. get a membership card now, or is I actually don't know. I don't know if his membership was removed. I don't know what the membership status is. But I think if he tried to get a membership card, they would they would reject his membership. But don't you have to pledge to support the party when you buy a membership? Yeah, that's generally yeah. Yeah. Okay. Scenario. All right, kids. I sure will. I'm sure we will come back to this in future pods. We may discuss the conservative leadership again in future pods. Not, not if Aaron wins the vote, then it's settled. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's squeeze in some hey yous here before we let the accursed off for the week. Ladies and gentlemen, please return to your seats. The hey yous are about to begin. You go, Anybody got it? Want to start? I'll start. And mine is just going to kind of carry on from the conversation that we had, the first conversation in terms of tone. Um, no one likes to put their elbows up uh, uh, more than me in politics. No one likes uh, uh, t s some good rhetoric here and there. But I think that uh, there is a lot of uh, there is a lot of uh, there is a lot of. Uh, politicians out there, um, uh, and I'm, I'm predo predominantly speaking about the prime minister, um, who are who are really trying to do continue the us us versus them um, in in terms of his rhetoric. I think his tone and tenor during the election. I think his tone and tenor after the election regarding uh, the treatment of people that uh, are not vaccinated or uh, have different opinions was right during the election. He said, "These are our friends. These are our neighbors. These are people we should talk to. These are not people that we should uh, castigate. These are not people that we should um, bully and." what have you. And he's taken a complete 180 turn on that seemingly for, um, uh, for political reasons. And I think it's not a good look. Uh, not only do I think it's just wrong politically for the Liberal Party of Canada as a Canadian, I think it's extremely raw. It's a very wrong tone uh, for the Prime Minister of Canada, uh, for the Prime Minister of Canada have. So my hey is to Justin Trudeau to tone it down. Okay, we're on full on partisan alert here because I'm coming at this and I'm throwing shade on exactly the other side and I'm throwing it hard. My hey yous to the Conservative Party, uh, and it extends from the conversations we've been having, both segments here today. And, you know, it's like, and like they give a flying fuck what Scott Reed thinks. But I'm saying, from my perspective, you're about to tear down a lousy leader, never found his footing because he never found the courage to stand for something consistently and persistently. You know, he was happy to flirt with the conspiracists when it served him, and then he was a red Tory when it didn't, and when it seemed like that was the better play. And... So it's going to seem like good sport to take that guy down and it's going to be justified because he fails the fundamental test of leadership. He's weak. He's weak and ill-defined and he's had plenty of time to uh, make himself strong and make himself defined. But from his ashes, something's going to arise. And, and right now, it looks to me like someone who's not a supporter of the conservatives 
and someone who's watching the movement and particularly watched this past weekend and, uh, and what led up to the weekend and the invitation that members of parliament and the Conservative caucus created for those people. Uh, it looks to me to be a brand of politics that's built on grievance and slights and feeding people their anger back at them and persistent false equivalencies what about isms, other guy isms, proudful circulation of falsehoods. It's a big, toxic, raging river of anti elite cultural combat. And I, I think that's a great way to cement your home with 25% of voters. Um, but it makes it awfully unwelcoming for anybody who's not already part of that minority. And I, I think if the conservatives opt to build their, their foundations on this sort of you know, the loose sands of lies and mistruths and vehemence, they're, they're going to crumble when. Voters take a closer look, and that's what happened this weekend. I think voters are taking a closer look, and they didn't like what they see, saw, and heard from the conservatives. And, you know, uh, my uncle used to say you slide a lot further on bullshit than gravel, but gravel is the stuff of a firm foundation, and nobody built anything that was lasting on bullshit. And I think the conservatives have a lot of thinking to do about this leadership race that's going to happen. Scott remains a liberal. Um Good, hey, you. Um, mine is much more pedestrian. Uh, I would like, in the midst of all this foo for all about these issues, I'd like the government to remain focused on cost of living, which is what Canadians want them to be focused on. And my friend Omar Al-Gabra, I saw you take the lead on supply chain stuff yesterday. It was a nice conflab. Follow that up. Run with it. Let's see some action. Give us some progress reports on what's been done, what's been accomplished. You can't do much about inflation, but what you can do, you should be seen to be doing. Stay focused on cost of living. Get that in the window and uh, and keep that, uh, keep that going. I want to end you guys, by the way, just so you know. Last week I had Trudeau back there. And, and that was the the program from Trudeau's retirement. This is the program from Guy Lafleur's retirement. Okay. That is the 1984 when Jacques Lemaire forced Guy Lafleur out prematurely. They had a tribute night to him at the Montreal Forum. And I was living in Saskatoon, but Terry was living in Montreal. And I sent Terry down to the Forum to, uh, to sneak inside and grab an official program. Um, here we go. Let's have a look. Oh, God. Very cool. Jesus Christ, he's beautiful. Oh. Yep. Yep. <sighs> You're Ken Dry, nay. Remember, I remember, I, I'm pretty sure you said it to both of us that one night, David, Ken said at dinner, he said, you know, Guy Lafleur was born to play hockey, right? Just like, just flat out, right? Just flat out, play hockey, score goals. God. Yeah. Oh, yes. Those were the Days, my friends. <laughs> they thought they'd never end, but they hey, did. We had big, we had, did, we had big news did. this week. Car Carey Price came out, gave a press conference, and said he hopes to play again one day. Scared the living not. Jesus out of me. I thought he was going to retire. I was so scared. I sent you guys notes. I was totally panicking and overreacting. Yeah. Turns out his knee's so bad he may never play again. All right. Let's thank our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and our sponsor, CN Rail, and let's... Thank all of our cursed who anxiously awaited this pod, and we hope it lived up to you. As John Lennon would say, I hope we passed the audition. <laughs>